The uh, Bible verse this morning will be 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. Why don't we stand up and greet somebody? Give a hug, handshake, tell them you're glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. here. All right, y'all, save some for later, my word. Goodness. It's good, it's good, it's good. Just tell your friends you'll finish the story afterwards, okay? Let's go ahead and have a seat. good to belong. It's good. It's good to belong. Uh, I love the movie Wizard of Oz. As a kid, it came on once a year. And I still remember when my mom bought a color television. Ooh. Anybody with me on this? To see the whole thing in black and white, not so much. Really, not so much. But my mom bought a 19-inch color television. And when the Wizard of Oz came on that year, wow. Right? When, when they land in Oz, remember? Next slide. I, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore, do you? 
Wow, has the world changed. Many people who are hearing this, whether they're in the building today or on YouTube, uh, they grew up in a, in a different America, an America that was uh, Christian. They grew up in a, a time where church attendance was high and church parking lots were filled and everybody had to fight to get out early so they could have a table at the restaurant. Remember those? Yeah. They'd get mad at the preacher because they went long because they can't get a seat at the table, have to wait longer in restaurants. I got chewed out all kinds of times. But I never apologized for feeding them spiritually. And I, every time I looked at their body, I'm like going, you could wait. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you are not going without food. And, and you know, Christianity influenced our culture. It influenced our society. Values and decisions in our society were firmly based on citizens' understanding of the Scripture. And, and the Bible was studied. People read the Bible at home on their own. And, and, and when the subject of ethics came up or the subject of philosophy came up, people not only, they would quote Scripture, your coworkers, your, your friends, your neighbors, your family members. I mean, even atheists were familiar with the biblical narrative in that day. Preachers and pastors and priests were held in high regard, very highly respected in their communities. In a post-war America, after the Second World War, if you were a, if you were a politician, you'd better, you'd better reflect your Judeo-Christian ethics if you ever expected to be elected. That's the way it was back then. Remember that? Well, it goes without saying, we're not in Kansas anymore. And the past 40 years have ushered in a tremendous amount of change in our culture. The influences and the values are shaping every segment of our nation are no longer aligned with Christian theology. I really despised it when our newly elected president, Barack Obama, on his first overseas trip, went up to a microphone, he said, you must understand that the United States of America is not a Christian nation. And I hated hearing that. And partly the reason why it bothered me so much was because he was correct. After he made those statements, I did some mission trips. I did one in Ghana, and then later on I did one in India. And the people in India in the church came up and asked me about that statement. They knew about it. The entire world knew that statement, as far as I know. And there were people in the church who came, and they said, what did he mean that America is no longer a Christian nation? I was really taken back that they... And I said, it's, sadly, it's true. There are a lot of Christians in America... But the laws and the leadership are not. And they know that, not only because of his edict, but because we have developed laws of, that, that, are, that are really fostering immorality, and eventually, because we're giving billions and billions and billions of dollars to third world nations, we start enforcing some of those things on them. They don't have those values if they want those billions of dollars of support. They're, they're very much aware that we are legislating things that they see in their Bible that God condemns. Well, things happened. What happened in the last 40 years? Baby boomers happened. I am a boomer. I dress like one, I talk like one, I joke like one. I, I am. I'm a boomer. I am. And uh, but what happened when the boomers came into power? When they when they stopped being kids and they grew up in their 20s and 30s and started influencing culture and politics and ethics and morals and and the biggest value of my generation, the one that I heard all the time and I 
boy, <laughs> I really trumpeted this too when I was younger, before I became a Christian. Everything was secondary to this. My individual freedom and my right of expression. Remember that? Anybody there, Dan? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody want to turn that microphone down? Woo! Thank you. The single greatest thing that I had as a baby boomer growing up is to express myself the way I wanted to and no one could say otherwise. And the greatest right I had was individual freedom, which meant, again, you can't tell me what I want to do and what I want to believe. The only way I'm ever going to really be fulfilled in life is to do what I want as much as I want it and nobody gets in my way. That was the value. That was the value. And guess how that value changed the landscape of America. The baby boomers walked away from Scripture. Yet they desired spirituality, and so they replaced the word Christian with spirituality. They replaced the word church with spirituality. The term spirituality encompassed all types of things, but because it was so non-defined, it allowed them to redefine religion in their own eyes. And so what they did is they developed a hybrid Christianity, using Christian terms and Christian words but this hybrid Christianity was filled with permissiveness. And, and this permissiveness made it easy for people to remain the way they were in their behavior and in their mores and ethics and still enjoy all the things that they wanted to do, but they were then invited into this movement. It's called the Seeker Movement. Uh, and, and, and to come in and be part of a church community. And so the baby boomers' greatest thing was, I want to do what I want to do, and don't tell me I can't. And they had an idea that permissiveness was the way to get it done, which means I can do what I want to and still be good with God. Why don't you join me where I am on Sundays, where everybody else has the same thing? And you can be here and be anybody you want to, as much as you want to, and you're not going to be called to change or give up or stop something because God loves you the way you are. Is this registering with anybody in the house right now? You see, it developed a mega church movement, and they ended up with these mega buildings, and they ended up with these mega productions, and they filled all these houses of worship across the suburban landscape, all the while ignoring the teachings that Jesus said about discipleship, holiness, and self-control. Those fall out of fashion when you want to have a permissive lifestyle. And this is what my generation did to Christendom when they came into power. Well, they started having kids, and baby boomers' kids are uh, called millennials. The older generation of their baby boomers' kids are called millennials. The second tier of baby boomer kids are called Generation Z. And these children of the boomers lack a basic understanding of the story of the Bible. They, they lack a biblical worldview. They lack a biblical view of God. And, and, and instead, they're convinced that uh, there, there isn't only one God to be worshipped. There are all kinds of gods and all kinds of religions, and all the religions are of equal standing because they're a religion. And no one has a right to say one is superior to the other. There are many paths to the top of this mountain. And this generation of younger adults in America, by the way, the millennials is the largest generation with over 80 million in the United States today. They are the power group right now. And, uh, and instead, they're convinced that, um, um, you know, that there is no one way or right way or true way. All that language has been dropped off. And so they're open to all kinds of religions. And they're open to all kinds of spirituality. And, uh, and, and, and in fact, because of that, they're often offended by Christians. They're, they're, they're afraid of Christians. And this is due in part to the betrayal in the last 30 years of, of, of biblical Christians in the media and on film. It, it, it's, it's no help that, you know, the, the movies coming out are not complimentary, humble, mature, intelligent, uh, uh, selfless, 
sacrificial, uh, beneficial people who love God and say so. You don't see that in a movie. You don't see that on a television program. What you're seeing is a, a caricature, a negative caricature of what God's people are really like. They, let me put it this way. They're not going to make a program about you in this room. You're not going to get a TV show or an article written about you because you're counteracting the image in which Hollywood wanted to project, and they project quite well. By the way, they did that because they got attacked by preachers back in the 30s, and they never have forgiven us for it. You know, when movies went wild, the preacher said, nuh uh Yeah. And so, younger generations, uh, they don't view Christianity as um, just something that other people do. They're, they're beginning to see it as a threat. And um, they don't see preachers as good guys. Um, they fear that preachers are teaching their children, uh, the churches, to be anti-tolerant, to be anti-inclusive, to be judgmental and condemning. I was reading a book, uh, and the, it, this is a true story. So uh, this youth pastor was new to his town, and so he joined a gym, and he's in the gym, and there's loud music pumping, and he, so, so he can pump iron. I guess that's how it works, right? Good music, good weights, or whatever. And so this young uh, worker at the gym, she comes up to the, to the pastor, and, 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 and she says, uh, isn't this a great song? And he goes, yeah, it is a great song. I actually had this CD. I love this CD. She goes, so do I. And so they started talking about how much they had in common for music, concerts they'd gone to. They both had enjoyed the same kind of concerts and um, music and all that stuff. And so she ends up, as they're talking over several minutes, she ends up asking him a question. The question is, what do you do for a living? He says, I'm a pastor. And he said that she took back, she almost stepped over the equipment and tripped over the equipment and she goes, no way, you can't be serious. And he goes, yeah. And he said, it took me a while to convince her that really was a minister and she was just shocked. Why? Why was he so shocked? Because this young adult woman was uh, not prepared to meet a pastor who was normal. <laughs> you know, an everyday guy who lifts weights and listens to music. So he asked her, he said, uh, what, what, ha what do you think a preacher is, is, uh, would be like? What, I mean, what's in your mind when you think about it? And she goes, oh, pastors are creepy guys who proselytize people for the Republican Party. Hmm, uh, don't be too shocked because she didn't know the word of God. She'd never attended church. The only preacher she'd probably seen was a street preacher. And you know, yeah, that guy. She and millions of millennials and Generation Zers have never met a nice, intelligent, mature church member. Well, actually, they probably have, but that Christian has not revealed they are one for fear of rejection. Most likely, that young lady has met a church member who sincerely loves God and is, and is a follower of Christ, but she didn't know it because that person lacked the boldness to share their faith in fear that they would be rejected. And, and this explains why non-denominational churches are going through such a major rebranding. You've seen it. You're driving around. You, you know what I'm talking about. They, 
Churches are trying to reach the unchurched. The unchurched have a negative view of Christians, and so they're working really hard to, to, to rebrand themselves as something that's more attractive. And the ultimate quality that anybody, any organization, or any church could have to reach those who do not go to church is to be cool. That's the deal. And so there's a big change now. And so they, they determined, these evangelical non-denominational churches have determined to drop hot words in order to look more attractive. They've replaced the word church. You won't see that in their marquee. It'll be called a center or a chapel. Uh, uh, they, they, they've, uh, they, they don't even use the word church. They call themselves like the bridge or life point or, or a cornerstone, you see. And, and they replace the word Christian. They don't use the term Christian to describe themselves. They call themselves a Christ follower uh, or maybe a believer or a disciple. And I don't want you to leave this room thinking I'm critical of what I'm saying. I'm not. I'm not critical of that. In fact, before Becky and I moved uh, back to California, we were church planters in Gilbert, Arizona. We started a congregation from scratch. I went through training and learned how to plant a church in an area that didn't have enough churches and trying to reach people who were not going to church. Obviously, I wasn't planting a church to get Christians to show up. And so we went through a tremendous amount of training to understand what was going on in the mindset of those who are not actively engaged in a faith community. And so we went through a lot of that. And when we started the gathering, we called it the gathering, and it was in, in, if you saw our logo, it would say, The Gathering, in really small print, a Church of Christ. And so we, we uh, when people would talk to me, I would use those terms, yeah, I'm a Christ follower, because I was on a mission to reach a target of people that were very, very, very hesitant to engage in a conversation with someone who was a evangelical or a Christian. And so, I'm just trying to explain to you what's happened. This is a, a foundational message for the rest of the series, talking about church and the value of church and why God wants us to belong to a local congregation. We'll go into all that. I just need you to understand the purpose, the reason for this series. Which brings us to our present dilemma. Those outside of the postmodern church don't want to join, and those inside the church are thinking of leaving. This explains why Christianity in the United States is in steep decline. In fact, it's in double digits decline now. And as of uh, all the research that I could find last week, nine of ten congregations in the United States are shrinking. Out of the one that aren't shrinking, some are holding their own, and then a very small percentage of that are actually growing. Once robust churches in the 1970s are nearly sparsely attended with huge empty church buildings where members are mostly from the builder generation. The builder generation is pre-1940. And so what we see across our landscape are a lot of big, large church buildings, but when you go in there on Sunday morning, you see a handful of very senior people. I was talking with uh, Keith Lancaster's wife because they did a, a song fest uh, down in Anaheim and, uh, right before they came to us. And I said, well, how did that go? And she said, well, it was, it was okay, you know. And I go, oh, and... and and I, I'm familiar with the L.A. churches to some degree. You should live in Ventura. And, and, and so I said, where was it? And she goes, Anaheim. And I go, Ball Road? She goes, yeah, it was in Ball Road. Well, listen, I, I, I used to have friends, or I have friends who used to go there back in the, remember the glory, can I say glory days? Do you guys understand? Just do this. Like, yes, I understand what you mean. But even if you don't know what I mean, just still do that, okay? <laughs> this is when the parking lots are full and everything's going on. There's lots of ministry, lots of events. People would have a, a gospel meeting, and people would show up in the middle of the week for a gospel meeting when they're already a Christian. 
I mean, really, it was big days, glory days. In Anaheim, Ball Road was a church, man. It was full and all kinds of stuff, deaf ministry and ministries all over and all that stuff. And there's another uh, a congregation. Oh, my word, it just dropped right out of my head. I'm sorry. It was uh, Garden Grove. And they had J.J. Turner and, 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 uh, and a big, huge, really huge active church. Well, Garden Grove had to sell their building because they couldn't fill it and keep it maintained. It was this gigantic, humongous edifice. They couldn't keep it going, and so they ended up joining Ball Road to try and work out a merger to keep enough people to keep things going, and that's where Keith did his song fest. And I just asked his wife, I said, it was just sort of a cavern, wasn't it? You know what I mean by that? Where you have a few people in a big, gigantic place, and they're singing, but, right? Hmm. Uh, when I was in Dallas going to preaching school, the largest congregation in Dallas was Highland Oaks. It was pushing 3,600 every Sunday morning. From what I understand, I don't know how accurate this is. I, I've tried to find an answer, but I think they're pushing around 700 today. Madison Avenue, Madison, Tennessee, Ira North Church, and the largest church of Christ for years and years and years, a fraction of what it was. That's just our fellowship. Mac Lynn is the person who puts out a directory that talks about how, you know, where the churches are and how many people go and what kind of churches they are. And so he was uh, interviewed in the Christian Chronicle in 2015, and he was asked what his concerns were about the serious decline of church attendance. And he said, the thing that concerns me most about this is the ever-increasing number of people who believe in God, identify themselves as Christians, but choose to have no affiliation to any church of any kind. The younger generations increasingly are buying into the worldly idea, it's just you and Jesus. You don't need a church family. Have it your own way. Whatever way works for you, and he says at the end of that, and they believe there's an app for that. And so we've seen in our lives a pendulum swing. And, and in 19, uh, 2008, before becoming a church planner, I went to a seminar that was talking about church planting, and Dr. Jerry Rushford from Pepperdine Lectures, uh, an expert in church history, especially history in the United States and on the West Coast, he, uh, he was keynoting at this uh, lectureship, and he lectured on, the, on church history in the USA, and he started at the foundation of the nation, and he worked up to the present and I'm going to fire through this, so if you're tired, stand up right now, okay? I need you to wake up. This is a lot of information, statistics. I understand that. It's not a traditional book, chapter, and verse, expository sermon. There's a reason for all this to be relevant, so just bear with me if you wouldn't, please. And so after the Revolutionary War, there was a drop in church attendance, and the reason why is because the families in the new country were building a life, and, and that took precedence over everything else. And with prosperity comes spiritual decline. Can I get it? Yeah. Immorality's consequence in that time was a lot of drunkenness, a tremendous amount of violence in our young nation, and that created hardship on families, which ushered in what's called the Second Great Awakening, 1800 to 1850. And these great and powerful preaching personalities are preaching in the huge cities and are riding by horseback and by carriage, and they're going out into the frontier, and they are convincing sinners to come back to God, to return to the church, to study their Bibles, and get saved. And it worked. And so when you have the 1840s and 1850s, church is now starting to really grow and expand. Uh, uh, buildings are being filled. New ones are being built. Christian universities are being established to train young people in the Word of God so they can serve the mission of the church. And, and, but the Civil War decimated church attendance. But after it, there was a rebuilding, and people were coming back to church, licking their wounds, looking for healing, looking for God's blessing, actually. And the pendulum swung in the other direction, away from church attendance, as the Industrial Revolution drew young people from the, 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 the agricultural remoteness and into the cities with high-paying jobs. And, uh, and, and when they did that, then, um, wow, again, prosperity does what to spirituality? Yeah. 
They began to make a lot of money, and they didn't have any accountability, and they left the church of their home. They called it the Roaring Twenties. The alcoholism was so severe, the government actually passed a law to prohibit the sale of alcohol nationwide. Why? Because it was out of control. And, and so, another factor happening during the Industrial Revolution was the growth of science. Many prominent scientists were denouncing religion, specifically Christianity, biblical Christianity, I might say. Sadly, in their attempt to war with science and technology and humanism, the church lost credibility with the press by calling all of that evil. That was, their, that was the label. Science was evil, technology was evil, everything else that wasn't in a church was evil, and that casted, that cast the church into an extremely negative view of people in our land, especially the intellectual, the academia, uh, the, everybody in power. The Depression came, World War II popped the bubble of prosperity, and families post-war sought God and his blessings, and babies boomed from the womb. Mobility and prosperity led to suburban explosion. The difference is in this time, because of atheism and communism, people didn't allow prosperity to take their spirituality. They actually went to church because of the communists and the atheists. And so to be American, it was American and patriotic to get your family in a station wagon and drive to a church building and get them all dressed up and sit on a pew. In 1964 was the, last, or was the highest uh, church attendance uh, marks on record, 1964, right during the Cold War, right when you were, some of you people were, remember how you used to have to nosedive under your desk at school when you did a nuclear attack warning thing? Remember that? Like that desk is going to stop that, right? But... So church attendance was at a high in 1964, but the pendulum, where is it now? Well, it, it's past center now, isn't it? And, and there's three big powers in our life. The government, education, and entertainment are pushing people away from, my, I, I, need to, I need to qualify this, biblical Christianity, meaning that we read the word, we understand what it says, and we do what it says. That's what I'm talking about, that kind of Christianity. Because there's other kinds of Christianity. Can I get a, oh, yeah, uh-huh. Well, there's a lot of Christianity out there just like, the Bible doesn't really matter. Let's just get together and worship and have fun, go to heaven. But you see, there's a part of Christianity that still takes the word of God seriously and has a high value for the will of God. And that part of the Christian thing has uh, been attacked over and over and is being attacked even more. Uh, this coupled with the weakness of the modern church prevents us from influencing others. We've retreated behind church walls. Uh, uh, that's become a, a, a dismal failure. We've decided to just pull our kids and all of our people, and we're going to have church in this hostile environment, and we built these fortresses. But you see, that hasn't worked because our own children in those fortresses are leaving us in droves. And I'm going to tell you why. The church in America has lost its saltiness and still remains in the shaker. We are no longer a light on a hill. We have huddled up to protect our families and ourselves, and it has failed us. Because the consequence of no longer being engaged in the community and in the society in which we live, we have lost our influence. And the people out there have no moral compass. They don't even know where north is. And that's on us. That's on us. So, where does the church in California look like in the future? In the immediate and even greater exodus of church members leaving by death or by door? We're aging out and people are no longer feeling a value for belonging to a congregation. If the antagonism that we are seeing today grows, then the church will go from being unpopular to persecuted. 
the first generation to fall victim, or the first congregations to fall victim to this persecution will be the mega churches, the big ones on the corners, the ones that draw all the attention. Next will be the long-term congregations, the ones that have been in place for 100 years and 80 years and such. According to uh, Rushford, he said, if this hostile period comes and the pendulum reaches its apex, many mainline denominations will capitulate to the culture to ease the hardship. They'll compromise to the morality that's forced on them by the government. He says it will be the small home-based churches that will thrive in this situation. And it will be the younger, newer congregations that will be able to have the fire and the resolve to disciple their members for the fight. By the way, I just, did, I just described the church in Russia and China and the Arab nations. That's, there's a church there. There are churches there. And they're underground. And they're not playing church. You can't. You've got to either be a real disciple or you're not going to make it. So the Bible actually talks about that. Charles did a great job of reading that passage that uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, his very last statement as he wrote Scripture, his very last book of Bible. He said, there is a godliness coming in the last days and it's going to be bad. And so it tells us these times are coming. It also tells us what to do. And so I'd like you to turn your Bibles to a passage as we finish today. In 2 Peter chapter 3, the very, very last thing that the Apostle Peter has ever said in Scripture, written for uh, you know, all of us to, to know and read. And, and in 2 Peter chapter 3, the very end, he says in verse 14, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. That sounds relevant. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved pa brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, 2 Peter 3, 16, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them in these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unable, uh, unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, who? Who? You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow. Grow, grow, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever to the day of eternity. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Simply put is this. The only way that we're going to survive in the days ahead, the only way we're going to do that is to grow in Christ. And the only way to grow in Christ listen to me right now, is to belong to a church. According to the Word of God, not my opinion. That is not my opinion. I did not opinionate. Church is not a biblical option. Well, now that we set the tone... I'm really proud of you, by the way. You've done well this hour. You've also been deeply impressive to me of how you do not cave in and give up. This is a unique and blessed, strong Church of Christ. Hello? This is a unique, a uniquely strong, loving, godly congregation. Rejoice that you're in it. Let's sing.